the anthrax because it is so hardy. Once made into a spore form, it will happily sit in a box on a shelf for years and remain infectious. And bioterrorism isn't the only way the anthrax microbe can kill. In its natural state, this spore-forming germ is found in soil and is nearly indestructible. Its spore can harmlessly survive for a hundred years, but if ingested by a grazing animal, the dormant spores somehow become active bacteria and germinate within the animal, causing terminal sickness. When the animal dies, the active bacteria revert back to spores. They, in turn, become a source of infection for humans, either by ingestion of the contaminated meat or contact with a skin lesion when handling the dead animal. The U.S. vaccinates cattle, so infections are rare. But this isn't the policy worldwide, which is spreading terror on plains and prairies across the globe. Sheep, cattle, on very rare occasions, humans, unless they're treated immediately, they almost always die. A rare and highly lethal form of transmission is through inhaling spores that come from decomposing animals. Once inhaled, anthrax spores travel to the lungs. Immune cells quickly arrive at the scene and engulf the spores, then transport them into the lymph nodes, which exist throughout the body and act as filters or traps for foreign particles such as bacteria. But once in the lymph nodes, the captive anthrax spores transform from dormant to active bacteria, thereby killing the immune cells in the lymph nodes. These deadly germs then break free and are released into the bloodstream. It'll actually start dividing and growing within the blood system. And there it actually starts producing a series of toxins, which we collectively refer to as anthrax toxin, that do direct damage to the host. In addition, they also suppress the immune system, allowing the bacteria to grow to very high numbers within the human host. In less than a week, these microbial fiends can multiply to such high numbers and secrete so much toxin that the blood vessels begin to leak uncontrollably. Loss of blood from leaky blood vessels results in multiple organ failure and death. Antibiotic treatment is effective if given during the first wave of disease to stop the bacteria from growing and reverse the disease. But once a certain concentration of bacteria and toxin has been reached within the host, antibiotics are no longer effective. Bacillus anthracis remains alarming. But are the scariest germs the result of nature or some other sinister force? The fact is, nature's done a very good job of creating some of the most diabolical and nasty viruses that we know about. In fact, one can argue that nature does a far better job of this than we will ever do. The next germ could become an even deadlier agent than anthrax. Number four, the variola virus, which causes smallpox. Smallpox is the organism that keeps me awake at night when I think about the biological terrorism threat. Smallpox is a frightening disease because the virus is easily transmitted through inhalation or physical contact with an infected person or object. In the 20th century alone, it wiped out 500 million people around the globe. The severe form, known as hemorrhagic smallpox, has a fatality rate of 90 to 100 percent. Unlike other viruses, humans are its only prey. Once inside the body, the variola virus replicates in white blood cells, the spleen, bone marrow, and lymph nodes, causing fever and toxemia before unleashing its full fury. After two weeks, the virus lodges in small blood vessels of the skin and mouth, hijacking cells to use their metabolic machinery to replicate. As it multiplies, the virus produces festering infectious blisters, and hemorrhaging in the skin and mucous membranes. All this leads to a painful death. 
because the virus has a very long incubation time before the classical rash breaks out, you can bet that there'll be many people infected before somebody determines that smallpox has occurred based on the presence of the classical rash. By the 20th century, smallpox had taken a terrible toll on the human population. In 1979, it was finally eradicated through a global vaccination program. The disease was gone, but the smallpox virus lives on. By an international agreement, the remaining vials of smallpox were to be kept in two guarded storage locations, one at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, and the other in Vector, a biological laboratory in central Russia. Countries were asked to send any isolates or collections of smallpox to one of these two laboratories. There's absolutely no way to verify that that was done. It's possible that there's smallpox virus, not by intent, but simply by oversight, sitting in freezers in various places around the world. Among other things, the smallpox virus is kept for its medical value in developing vaccines for other illnesses. But many worry that the remaining vials of the virus could get into the wrong hands and be used as a biological warfare agent. The vaccination program was so long ago that the memory cells of those who were inoculated are no longer effective at mounting a counterattack. And currently, there's no policy to vaccinate the general population against possible bioterrorism agents. If anybody got a hold of the smallpox virus and decided to use it as a biological weapon, it would be a nightmare because the virus spreads very quickly from person to person. And once that happens, it's unlikely we could stop the outbreak with vaccination. Smallpox has the potential to kill again. That's why it's number four. But there's another ancient germ that hasn't stopped killing since almost the beginning of human civilization. You're hiking in the mountains. The setting appears peaceful and serene. But nearby, a killer patiently waits for its next victim. Number three. Yersinia pestis, which causes the bubonic plague. A swarm of fleas are infesting a dead squirrel. While drawing blood from the animal for sustenance, the fleas also ingest treacherous bacteria. The germs don't kill the fleas, but will use them as transportation. Now, the fleas search for another source of blood, and it happens to be you. The bacteria come along for the ride. You feel bites on your arm. The flea's saliva, now filled with the bacteria, is injected into your skin through their tube-like mouth. You swat them off and continue to hike. But the lethal bacteria have stayed and found a new habitat to breed. They travel to your regional lymph nodes and begin multiplying. This causes swelling the size of oranges in your armpits, neck, and groin from inflammation and the white blood cells that rush to the scene. 